And we are live. Thanks, John, and welcome everyone to Connected Learning TV. So this is our kickoff webinar to our October series for Connected Educator Month called How to Be a Better Connector, Strategies for Educators, Parents, and Admins. So I'm Beth Holland, I'm an instructor and I'm the Communications Coordinator at EdTech Teacher and we've partnered with Connected Learning to bring you this webinar series for the month. So for today I will be your host uh, and then we'll have a variety of other speakers coming in throughout the month. So for the rest of the month of October on Connected Learning TV, we're going to be exploring how educators and parents um, and learning environment admins can really help to support the principles and values of connected learning. And that's really our big picture, but today we're going to chat specifically about why and how elementary school educators should engage in inner classroom collaboration, how to make that process manageable, and where that may go. Uh, but before we dive into our actual conversation, a few quick details. So the first one is, for those of you who are watching live right now, we definitely welcome your comments and your questions. You can do that either through the Twitter hashtag, and we're going to use the one for Connected Educator Month, which is hashtag CE14, so CE14. Or if you're watching via the Google Plus event page, we will do our best to adjust, address your questions um, here in the Hangout if you plug them in on the event page. And we're also going to be chatting throughout the month um, in the Connected Learning Google Plus community. So hopefully you can join the conversation there. So before continuing too much further, I've got a great set of guests with me tonight. Uh, I was saying earlier, I'm super excited to have these three individuals here because normally when it comes to connected learning, I actually just talk about them. So tonight, all I have to do is ask questions and I can let them talk about themselves. So what we'll do is, uh, at least going from my left to, uh, to right, we'll start with Ben and have everyone please you know, say hello, introduce yourself, tell us a little about yourself, and then we'll get started. All right. Uh, my name is Ben Shorsten. I'm a K-5 technology integration specialist in Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, I've spent some time teaching kindergarten, third grade, and fifth grade. And, um, you know, I think it's great the digital resources we have today to connect kids across, across classrooms and schools and states and, and the world. Thanks, Chris. Uh, ben, go ahead, Kristen. Uh, hi, my name is Kristen Wydeen. Uh, I teach a grade 2 3 classroom in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And um, I have been teaching for about 16 years. And I have a 2 to 1 ratio for iPads in my room, and this is the third year. All right, go ahead, Susie. Hi, I'm Susie Brooks, and I'm a fourth grade teacher in Falmouth, Massachusetts. This is my 10th year in the classroom. Um, I work a lot doing PD in our district, and I do some professional development around Massachusetts as well, and I like to help teachers a lot on social media. And we're figuring out how to use technology this year. Great, thanks. So I'm, again, thrilled to have these three people here tonight for the conversation. It certainly makes my job easier since I usually do talk about them. But what we'd like to do just to kick things off is if each of you can talk a little bit about what you see to be the real benefits of connected learning, whether it's connecting you know, students with other students or even teachers and teachers. And you know, what does this learning look like? You know, how, does it benefit students more if they're working together face to face? Is, you know, where's the value of it being, you know, digitally thinking as well about could asynchronous platforms like blogs or forums be just as effective and engaging as being able to be on something like this, like a Google Hangout. So I will maybe just to keep things organized for right now, I'll let Susie go first since I know she just wrapped things up and we'll work back the other direction. Um, but, you know, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on what this looks like. Okay. So it's funny because um, moving to fourth grade, I'm thinking that being connected with classrooms and others outside of our classroom is um, a lot different now because we're studying the regions of the United States and Canada and Mexico and China. So it takes on a whole new meaning for me this year, things I hadn't thought about as much before. So for 
our class, it's going to bring geography to life. It's going to make it way more real than it ever has been. And also, the time zones are really going to become real for them. Um, it was a little bit realer last year when we were connecting with our buddy classroom in Nome, Alaska. And literally, it was like lunchtime for us when they were coming into the classroom. But um, it's, it's neat for students to really be able to wrap their heads around it instead of me just trying to describe it or draw it or watch a video about it. And I think also that being able, especially when you're doing video communications with other people or other classrooms, is teaching the students the give and take of conversations, asking a question, waiting to hear the answer, and then waiting to be able to speak again. So those are the big pluses for me that I'm seeing already as being benefits this year, as opposed to what I've done before. It's the benefit of a new grade level. Great. Thanks. And it, it is hard to remember that you're fourth grade and not third grade, but I think it does bring a lot of exciting stuff. And I guess we'll, we'll continue our geography and, and Kristen being in Canada, you know, how are, how are you using things? I'll let you go next. I was trying to come up with a segue there. I'll go with geography. <laughs> um, I totally agree with what Susie was saying. Um, I think using blogs and Twitter, they give my students more freedom than face-to-face. -face. Uh, we don't have to schedule the time. They can post something on their blogs and uh, the next day maybe someone has posted something, a comment on their blogs. Or we use, a, we use Twitter a lot and it's always on. Um, there's no, you know, I'll, Susie, what's your time zone? We need to figure out uh, what, you know, what's best for you. Oh, that's recess for me kind of thing. So um, using Twitter and blogging definitely, you don't have to worry about those things. Um, and uh, for example, just today, my students were putting math problems on Twitter, and um, they will go back to them tomorrow to see who, and thank you, Beth, for answering one of my students today. But um, So tomorrow, they'll go back, and they'll look at those, and um, they'll get back to the person that's, that has responded with, yes, that's correct, this is why, or no, this is not correct. Um, so. The big, the big thing for my class is that audience piece, and it's that engagement piece. They're not, they're not creating things for me anymore. They're creating things for people that are all over the world, and they do get that feedback from those, those other students and adults. So, it's, uh, it's a fantastic feeling. I, I was enjoying the math problems today, <laughs> and. And I think it's actually an interesting point you made about the asynchronous nature and the fact that it's not the scheduling, like when are you free, when am I free, and you know, I know last year we tried to actually organize like a Google Hangout field trip and it just never happened between, you know, my schedule and your schedule and time zones, um, but with Twitter we were able to connect and so I think that was, that was a great point. Um, ben, I'm going to let you jump in next. All right. Um, yeah, I have to agree that having that, that asynchronous setup can be really helpful. Um, in terms of dealing with schedules. The piece that, that, that jumped out for me is, is the idea of getting different perspectives um, about school and about learning, that it's really easy for adults and kids to sort of get caught in this idea that, that m every classroom looks like my classroom um, and every child's experience in elementary school is just like mine. And this connected learning really allows kids and adults to be reminded that, that schools are really different from community to community and from state to state and from country to country. Um, and I think that's a really important skill and an important piece of knowledge for kids to come away from school with, that, that the, the experience they have is not necessarily the experience that everybody else has. I think uh, that's an amazing point. And actually, uh, Jenny McGarra, who teaches in the south side of Chicago, made that point um, back in a talk she did this summer, talking about how here are her students, which is a predominantly African-American neighborhood in the south side of Chicago, and they were doing a Google Hangout with a school on the North Shore, which is a predominantly white uh, suburban neighborhood, and they were supposed to be talking about math, and when the Google Hangout came up, all, the, all of a sudden, you know, her students were saying, wait, they have white kids in that school, and then the other students were saying, wait a minute, that class doesn't look like our class, and so they ended up with these entire conversations that evolved that had absolutely nothing to do with math that they were trying to do, but it was just being able to see, you know, what are those those differences of those classrooms and how to start to connect them. And I think you make, you know, you've all made these great points about how we can start to use these opportunities to expand, you know, what our students can experience and what otherwise could be, you know, a relatively small environment. Um, I always I taught in a school that was, you know, preschool through eighth grade. It was 230 students. 
I mean, I am on an island in Rhode Island, so it's like an island in the smallest state, and so our worldview is teeny tiny, and any time the kids could start to see beyond where we are, it was always such a, an eye-opening experience. So, you know, a lot of you, you know, you mentioned some of the challenges about working asynchronously versus synchronously and, and trying to get scheduling in, and I guess one of the things that, that often comes up is, is what are those challenges of being able to virtually connect with other classrooms. So, you know, aside from some of the normal, like, technology reliability concerns, what, what challenges do come up? Because I think it's important to talk about those as well. So I'm not sure who wants to, I'll leave this one up to you guys, who wants to take over on this one, but, but have you found that there are those challenges and how do you deal with them? Um, I think that um, for some teachers, one of the problems is to find classrooms to connect with. Um, if you don't know where to look or don't know, it can be a daunting task if you're new to this. Um, and also, um, I know a lot of educators that are starting to become connected. They're starting with their Twitter feeds and things like that. So if you aren't a connected educator yourself, um, I think that's where you need to begin because that's where you make those connections. You make those connections through um, chats on Twitter and um, you know webinars like this and and things like that because I think um, a lot of new people that are thinking that this is you know this is a great thing to try they're they're asking where do I start? So I think that's probably the biggest um, challenge. And it's funny, Kristen, because when you talk about people who are new to the whole idea of connecting globally or connecting beyond their classroom, it, Beth mentioned the whole reliability thing, and I know that that can be a huge issue. So I always feel bad for the teachers that just plan and plan and plan, and they're ready, and they're finally going to try it, and then the technology kind of bottoms out on them. And so I think that it's huge for, I mean, teachers obviously to learn, but for kids to learn that whole patience piece and to know that there's going to have to be a plan B or even maybe a plan C. We had planned for weeks to Skype with a parent who was on a business trip out in the middle of the South Atlantic off the coast of South America, and he was going to do a science experiment where we were testing the salinity of the water to see how far out the Amazon River flows. We had been studying it, talking about it. We were so ready. We were connecting by um, satellite. It was very fancy. And then the whole Skype session bottomed out on us and we couldn't see him anymore. He had just pulled the water out and told us what the salinity levels were and then we couldn't hear him or see him anymore. And um, even for someone who's pretty seasoned and used to technology snafus, it was frustrating. So we ended up typing back and forth for the next 45 minutes and literally like I would type a question from each student and on his end, on the middle of the ocean, was typing back to each of them. So I think that it's really important to be to be ready on it, to be ready for it not to work because it's more common than not. I don't. I didn't want to kind of skip over that because I think it's important for teachers to know it's very normal for it not to go well. Definitely, I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> I think there's this 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 additional piece that as we um, as we shift the curriculum and as we do more and more high stakes testing, uh, particularly in the U.S., that there's this issue of you know how do I as a teacher justify this time. Um, you know, this I know it's a great learning experience, but it's not in the curriculum, and it's not going to be on that thing that I'm going to be tested on at the end of the year. Um, and so, how do I how do I feel good about it from that sense? How do I make sure that my my administration is okay with it? Um, and certainly, I don't think anyone's going to argue that that these aren't great learning experiences. You know, but what happens when they're not on that you know clearly articulated list of things I'm supposed to do this year? That can be a tricky position for adults for for teachers to be put in. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was reading um, lately in uh, Will Richardson's book, Why Schools, if anyone's read that, and I was finishing it, and he was talking about exactly what you're saying, Ben, of, you know, how are teachers, you know, they want to innovate, we're trying to do things, but there's still those other things, and, you know, that you're being held to, and so one of the, the challenges that he actually talked about is, is how do we look at being able to bring these things together and something like being able to be connected, you know, Kristen, you gave the great example about doing the math problems. Well, the math problems are still part of the curriculum, you know, and Susie, you mentioned the geography and the geography is still part of the curriculum and so I think a lot of times it's that challenge of how am I going to bring these things together where it's almost like double dipping. Um, so that's 
something that might you know might help a little bit when starting to think about it. And and one last piece of to address Kristen's point about where to begin, there are a handful of other resources like Skype in the classroom, you know, and like the mystery Skypers, and there's a couple of organizations that have you know, started to come up with ways to bridge that gap and to say, okay, well, here's a starting place, almost like a, a mini packaged lesson to give it a shot. Um, you know, before we keep going too far, there's um, there was a question that came in from the audience, and we'll just go ahead and, you know, pull this one in first, is the question was, like, how do you get your peers, you know, to see the why of what you do with connecting with others? And I think, you know, Ben, I may put you on the spot since, yeah. since you were addressing that a little <laughs> bit, but, you know, how do you start to explain that um, when you're talking about what you do? Um, if you can get if you can get teachers to come in and see what you're doing, um, I think that's that's a really important piece. Um, you know, we're all in this for kids, and when you have these connections, they, you know, kids are clearly excited about it. They're really engaged. They love what they're doing. Um, and if you can get another teacher or a principal, another administrator in the room to see that, um, I think that can be a really great hook for getting them uh, getting them involved and getting them invested in it. Beth, I, can I just add something there? I think also um, I, tr I try to be very transparent in my classroom and I try to blog about the ups and downs. And so the thing, the things that are we're doing in class, I try to um, share that on my blog so people can see that you know this is the why we're doing this and this is what's happening in the classroom and this is what it, what's resulting from it. And uh, I think that's a big thing too, is just to be completely transparent with what you're doing and try to share it. You know, we have, I almost feel like we have this obligation that we need to get this information out because it's, it's valuable and, uh, and people need to know about it. Yeah, on that note, I always, you know, tell my teachers that, that if we don't tell our story as, teach, as, as educators, then someone else is going to tell it for us. Um, and I would rather get my version of the story out than have somebody else tell the story. Definitely. Yeah. And the more we share, the more others become excited about what we're doing, and I think that it encourages them to, to wade in as well and give it a try. And I will say with, with all three of you, you're incredibly transparent on your blogs and you're also very like thorough and thoughtful and it's always really nice to see, you know, not just that quick snapshot of, you know, here's what I did, but here's why I did it. And so, you know, I think that's something that's definitely, you know, as um Chris, I think as you said it, you know, as educators, like we have to be connected learners so that we can really model that for our students because if we're not modeling it, then they don't necessarily know, well, what does it mean to be a connected learner and, and how do I get there? Um, and so, you know, and I think along those lines, and maybe I'll use this as a segue a little bit into our next question, is is how do you ensure that when you're doing these um, experiences and looking at this inner class collaboration, how do you make sure it doesn't become a burden or like one more thing that a teacher has to do? You know, do you have some suggestions for how you keep the process really fun and engaging and and for the kids to still really want to be involved, you know, after the novelty effect, how do they want to keep going and continuing the conversations? Um, when last when I'm asked to join like a collaborative project, um, I first ask myself how it fits into my curriculum because um, then I can say, okay, we're doing this because of this. And um, another key point is. I talk to my students about it and we make the decision together. If if they don't want to participate, if they're not engaged to do this, then we're not going to we're not going to do it. So I do give them they get to vote and we get to we decide make the, those decisions together. So um, last year when we created the uh, global iBook, um, we decided as a group how we were going to learn about different communities. And uh, we brainstormed what we could do, and then we decided as as a class um, that we wanted to hear from other classrooms around the world, and that's that's how that whole um, iBook kind of took form was because of my students brainstorming, not because of me. So um, I think that's very important that you know, oh, another another hangout, right? You know, or it has to be something that that they value and uh, that they're excited about. So you need them to have that buy-in. I'm glad you mentioned the global iBook because that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, well, how did you get that going? And um, in terms of getting into, and I'm thinking as well, and you know, I know some of the teachers that participated and how they were so excited and their students were so excited to have that opportunity to contribute 
and I think a lot of it may be, you know, because again, we could tell your students were, were driving that with the way that you set it up. I think it's also important um, for teachers to, to start small at an area where they feel comfortable, especially if they're new to the whole process. So whether it's connecting with someone that you already feel comfortable with, you feel comfortable making mistakes in front of, you feel comfortable trying again if it doesn't work well the first time, to really set up an environment where you feel comfortable. But to, to parallel what Kristen said, I think it's also important to let your kids know what it is that you're going to do or that you're going to try and what your fears or concerns are as a teacher. Because I have always found that the kids will rise to the occasion so that that doesn't happen. Like, I think this might happen, and they'll be like, no, it won't. And so I think that that's huge also. It gives them even more buy-in to make, to make it happen and make it partly their responsibility as well. And so before I let you off the hook, or I'm going to put you on the hook, I guess, is, you know, I was thinking as well about your, like, your Books for Babies project and how that was, you know, one of the, if you could talk about that for a second, because I know that was something that kids really took a lot of ownership in, and it wasn't that it was connecting, you know, digitally, but you were certainly making those connections into the community in a way that gave them that meaningful opportunity. Right. That kind of goes against my advice to start small. Um, that, was, that was a huge project. And that seems to be what works for me, picking something really big that I commit to because then it's hard to back out of. Little things are easy for me to put to the side. Um, but you're right, being able to say to kids at the end of this, we're going to be able to um, bring our recordings and our books and our persuasive writing and everything that we've worked on, we're going to bring it to the hospital so that brand new parents can can give them to their babies. They felt a huge um, responsibility to teach these parents how important it was for babies to be read to when they're little. So that, that connectedness to our community was very powerful and it helped to drive the bus so to speak. Thanks. Oh. Ben, did, did you have anything you wanted to add? We sort of yeah. lost you um, <laughs> um, Yeah, Susie was talking about starting small which I think is really um, can be an important step and also if there are other folks in your building whether it be um, a tech integration person like myself or another classroom teacher who's done something similar um, if you can get them out of your classroom to be with you while you try it out. Um, and maybe they just sit in the back and they're you know, sort of that extra set of hands in case something goes wrong. Um, but somebody who's done it before, um, that can be a huge piece of confidence uh, for teachers to, to help them take that first step, um, to have somebody with them there while they do it. Okay. And I guess, you know, along those same lines, like what would you suggest as like tools or platforms or apps or, you know, ways for or, th or things for teachers to actually use when they start to make these connections, you know, from a technical standpoint, you know, and have you tried different tools when you're connecting internationally versus nationally? Um, you know, what have you found that's been, been really successful for these types of, like, communication and collaboration? I think that, um, that for me, Twitter has been the beginning of all of my connections. Um, outside my building and outside my district. That's, that, that, that's where it began. Um, and then sort of moved into, which was sort of interesting, is, is getting to know folks on Twitter and then running into them in real life at conferences um, and having that connection of, wait, I know who this person is. You know, I've had conversations with them. I, I know something about you know, what they think about education, what's important to them, and now I'm meeting them for, uh, for the first time. Um, but I think Twitter is a really good place to start with that. For us, it's been really powerful to be able to have video in the classroom, and whether that's Skype or Google Hangouts or FaceTime or whatever seems to work that particular day, um, that's been really powerful. And sometimes that's another classroom. Sometimes that's um, a parent of a student that's on a business trip, and that's happened many times, and that's been really cool. Um, we've even had a rogue celebrity show up and talk to our kids. So that's been that's been really powerful because they're larger than life when they're shown up on the smart board and the kids love being able to see and be heard. Um, they really make, they really feel special I guess is what I'm trying to say when, when they're on these calls, when we're planning for them, when we're in them and then afterwards when we debrief and talk about how it went. So I love that. Um, I, I agree with both of them. Um, Twitter not just for myself though, for my students is, I think that's our biggest tool um, in my classroom right now just because 
um, they really have started to create their own student learning network um, and um, I really tried to let them know how much I've learned from the from people on Twitter and how we've done these chats and now they're making these connections with other students from other schools and uh, you know their 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 parents are um, following us and answering questions and and they get to see their learning during the day um, so I think Twitter is, is a huge part of us connecting um, and another one is our blogs um, mm -hmm. We uh, we have um, the primary blogging community that um, is my baby and that we just began this past week. Um, and so it's classes K to 5. It used to be K to 2, and it's kind of grown um, over the years. Um, but we have a group of four um, classes that are about the same age as um, my class, and they get to comment on each other's blogs. And so when it's your focus week, um, my students could get up to a hundred um, a hundred comments for that week and so there's this huge um, excitement that week uh, they want to write, they want to produce things for their blogs because they want that feedback from um, other students and we've had kids from Iceland and Hawaii and you know all over Australia so um, we've had kids from all over the world posting on my students blogs and that's a very exciting thing so cool. um, speaking of blogs there was one question that came in from the audience and I'll put this out to all of you but you know do you moderate your students blogs and like how do you ensure your students are you know staying on task and using appropriate language and do you worry at all about you know the types of comments that are coming in um, you know, any advice there um, I would have to say first model, 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 model <laughs> and then um, second of all um, I do not moderate my students blogs um, I did start when I first started I, I did moderate them I do moderate everything that comes in so all the comments I do moderate they come through me first and um, because those I can't control they're from people that from all over um, so those do come through me and I moderate those um, but my students I'm very strict with things like that if they're not using the iPad as a tool um, then it gets taken away um, it's a privilege and it's a tool in the classroom and if you can't use it properly then it's taken away for the day and um, they know that they know my expectations and I really at the past three years we've had one incident and it was it, it was very a very minor incident that was a great learning experience for the rest of the class so hmm. I would love to be able to do that I feel like this year it's really hard we're very limited in our access to technology so the students aren't being able to interact with it as often as they have in past years because there's the same amount of technology but the great problem is more teachers want to use it so it means that there's less of it to use so to speak so because the students aren't interacting with their blogs as much as they have in years past I feel like I do have to still moderate them um, just to make sure that I see what's going out I'm very clear about expectations and modeling I agree is just key for them to be able to know what's out there and what what's acceptable and what's appropriate and what's engaging what makes your writing worth reading but I still feel because we're just not on on not on enough that we still have to moderate it maybe it'll change halfway through the year we'll have to see how that goes you just intrigued my thinking Kristen I um I had a group of third graders a couple years ago and we started using Twitter as just a really simple microblogging platform primarily to speak to parents um, rather than doing like a weekly newsletter at the end of every week that I would get stuck on Friday afternoon writing um, we would in, in the beginning with that modeling that came up a lot um, would as a group craft a, uh, a short tweet to tweet out to the parents of what we did that day um, the the, uh, the big idea behind it being that when kids come home and parents ask them what they did and they say nothing because that's what they say um, the parents would have a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of insight to be able to ask more a more specific question about what the what the kids did that day um, and so we started doing that as a group and then it became a job in the job chart and so at the end of every day when kids went to lockers to go pack up two or three kids would come and sit with me 
Um, and it was always in uh, in the kids' language. Um, they would write it, I would type it out. And every once in a while, I would have to do a little bit of moderating. Um, if they were describing something in the classroom that just would would be interpreted differently by someone who wasn't there, um, it was hard for them to sort of see that that other perspective. So there, were, you know, every couple of weeks, I would you know we try to rephrase something. But for the most part, I really tried to keep it uh, in their language as much as possible. I know when I was first starting out, we didn't, like, the blogging platforms didn't really exist yet, and we were trying to come up with solutions for, like, how to get all the kids to contribute to, like, a class blog or something else, and we actually used Google Forms, because the kids could submit their posts wherever they wanted, and I didn't have to use accounts or logins or anything, and that was just a really simple way where, you know, as the teacher, all of the form, you know, all the responses would come to me, and I had it on a spreadsheet, and then... I could either just copy and paste it to the blog and hit publish and say to the kid the next morning, oh, look, I put it up, or I could take it and print it out and say, hey, let's use capital letters or whatever it might be that needed, you know, as you said, the modeling piece to come back. Um, you know, and, and what you've said as well and I'll, is uh, that reminds me, Devorah Heitner, who did a webinar with us back in September, had this great idea where she actually was using the student blogs and then she created the Parent Commenters Club where essentially there were parents that were looking for ways to get involved with the classroom but they couldn't always connect you know, during the school day. And so she said, well, would you like to be commenters? And then they would go through and read the kids' blogs and provide positive feedback. So all the kids always had a comment on their blog and you know, she knew that it was coming from someone that cared and who it was and so then you know, the kids had that feedback and Kristen, like you said, then the ability to know the kids are going, wow, look at all the people that are reading my blog post. And so, you know, by having those parent commenters, it was one more way to get people involved and to, to give the students that audience. Um, and, you know, thinking about this as well, you know, and Susie, you touched on it a little bit, but when, you know, we want to create all of these opportunities for students to be able to connect with a broader audience, but you know, what do you do when access to the technology is is limited? You know, when they don't have the iPads available or Chromebooks or anything else, and and how how can you start to make some adjustments that way? Um, it's yeah, it's a challenge. I think I've been under the assumption for the past I don't know seven, eight, nine years that every year I'd have more and more access or um, more devices at our disposal. And so this year it has turned that whole belief system on its head. So I'm back to almost where I was years ago. I have just my laptop with a smart board and a digital, um, what do you call it, a document camera. And then I have my iPad, my iPhone, and two other um, tablets. And that's it. Um, we're still trying to hash out how to share 22 iPads with 500 kids and also how to get me to help out in the computer lab because now we finally have a computer teacher full-time, which is awesome, but that means I'm not in the lab with them anymore. So I'm not really having those same opportunities. So I really have to be more creative when it comes to how are we going to make this work. So those those tablets and that iPad has become, um, they've become essential tools in my classroom and it's no longer that all the kids have something to use, it's back to taking turns and making sure that we understand not everybody might get a turn today. So it was really a reality, um, <laughs> like a wake up call for me, like how can I change what I'm doing? And we're hoping to be able to institute BYOD, we've done it for the past two years. Um, but it's really hard for me to do that as a teacher without the possibility of having devices for students who can't bring anything in. What are they going to use? So it's been really tricky to wrap my head around how to change things. But having those few devices available and being very, again, very honest and upfront with the students, like this is what I'm dreaming we'll be able to do by the end of the year, but it's going to take us a while to get there. How can we make this work? And because they're a little older and they're dying to use the technology, they're really willing to sit and brainstorm, well, maybe we could try this or maybe we could try that. So getting our blogs up and running has taken longer. Getting our Twitter feed rolling has taken a little bit longer, but they're they're happening. So um, it's it's been kind of neat to be able to see it still work with a life um, with a lifeboat instead of a cruise ship. Christian <laughs> um, and Ben, do you have anything else you want to add on that one, or you have devices? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we have devices. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, they went from, um, they're kind of, my. De I have no complaints because I do have quite a few devices in my room, but they've gone on lockdown. So um, we can't add apps when we want to or, so um, right now they haven't been updated so a lot of the apps don't work. So it's, it is, it's being creative and using what you have, what you, um, what you can use. Um, and we also um, have a bring your own device um, policy. So um, I do have students that bring their, you know, iPods and their iPads in. Um, and I think it's because they've seen um, so much growth in um, how our school is running, the running, um, you know, using technology that their parents have been buying, buying them more things for Christmas or their birthday. So they do have some technology to bring in, and um, the older kids all have telephones, so they use their phones, um, and that kind of frees up technology in the older grades for um, students in the younger grades. So. Yeah, so we're uh, we're one to one um, in my building. So we certainly have the devices, um, you know. But there are also those th those days when when the internet goes down, when the wireless isn't cooperating, um, and you know the uh, the devices can't take the place of good teaching, and and you you still need to have that plan B for sure. And I guess you know when you start bringing this in, I guess looking at both you know the use of devices and not using them. How do you scaffold? You know, how do you scaffold this process and start teaching these younger students, like, you know, this is what you need to know to be an effective online communicator, and here's how we're going to do all of these things. Because, you know, just in this conversation, we've talked about, oh, we use a Google Hangout and Skype and blogs and Twitter, and, and how do you start to explain all of this to, you know, a seven-year-old? We do some work with, um, we have first grade buddies in our fourth grade class, so when they're available we're able to work with the devices with our first grade buddies and our fourth graders, and last year our third graders are very proud to show what they're doing and it's funny, they might not be crazy about some of the rules that we um, put out there, but when they're ready to explain it to somebody younger, they're very capable of explaining what the rules are and why we have them. Um, so I know that deep down they really understand what we do and why we're doing it in order to be able to learn when we're out there, but we need to be safe while we're doing so. So it's been kind of neat to be able to see those relationships, um, those collaborative relationships build over the year. I think for me, um, when I got the iPads, I was teaching grade one, and so it's baby steps. Um, I started with showing them my blog and I and my Twitter feed, and what I did with it, and what it, why it was useful for me, and um, we went from there. Um, and um, it always starts with the safety piece. Um, I know that one of the questions is, how do you um, keep you know, how do you ensure that to those parents that you're keeping your, your those kids safe? And um, that's my number one priority is keeping those children safe. So um, we go over, even today, we did it today again, that we don't, you know, share personal information. And we, I had, um, we were talking about doing comments on blogs and I had a bunch of comments that I had made up and there was one that had, you know, I live at, you know, their address and their phone number, and all my students were like, <gasps> you know, you never do that, you know. So um, we start baby steps, but the, the safety piece is definitely the first thing that we talk about. And I think that communication with the parents that this is, these are, what this is what we're doing to keep your student, your, your children safe. Um, I'm not going to do anything that I wouldn't let my own son, my seven-year-old and my four-year-old children do. So... Um, I think that's definitely key. Yeah, I think, Kristen, you bring up a really important point, and that is making sure that, that we're communicating with parents about what's going on um, and that, you know, we have rules and filters set in place, and ideally they would be perfect all the time, but we know that they're not. Um, and then having those conversations with the kids about, you know, if something, if you stumble across something that makes you feel uncomfortable that you know is against the classroom rules, then please stop and find an adult so we can have that conversation um, and have that teachable moment. And then as soon as the kids are out of the room, 
you know, email the parents and let them know. Um, you know, I have had those, those situations happen uh, in the classroom. Um, kids went to lunch. I blew most of my lunchtime writing an email to the parents about what happened and how we dealt with it. Um, and all the responses I got from parents were really positive um, to say thanks. And I'm really glad someone is someone is handling this. And um, you know, they were just they were happy to know um, that that there was a system in place that if something gets through the internet filter, if something comes up on a student device, that you know, there are adults there who, who are going to deal with it and we're going to talk about it and uh, and work through it and make sure the parents are, are, are informed. Thanks. And Kristen, thanks for, for bringing up the, the parent issue because I had seen that, you know, question as well. Like, you know, how do you explain to students, you know, how you're going to keep them safe and, and to let the parents know as well. You know, when the kids go home and they still want to do things, how do the parents know what is or isn't okay? Um, Susie, before we keep going, do you want to say anything or have anything to add? No, I always think, though, that the window of opportunity to be able to teach kids about being digital citizens is actually smaller than we probably want to admit before they start to get their own accounts. And a lot of the times parents don't know that they have them. So it, I feel that it's it's so vitally important to be able to teach the kids about how to use technology responsibly, but also to teach parents, so to be able to put um, resources maybe in your weekly newsletter to parents for them to be able to check it out or to blog about the things that are important to you especially when it comes to digital citizenship so that it's something that they're thinking about before their kids get their own accounts. I think that's been another eye-opener for me as a fourth grade teacher is how many of my students already have accounts. Um, so of course I don't want them to yet. They sh really shouldn't have very many accounts. At you know, age nine and ten, but they do. So that window is it's a lot smaller than than we care to admit. Yeah. And you know, I think along those lines as well, you know, how do you also, you know, address parent and school concerns about, you know, trust and privacy with all of this? Um, you know, what are some of your like go to explanations or arguments for, you know, you want to give the students, you know, access to the world and, you know, Kristen, you said that, you know, they can write and it's not moderated and, and how do you, you know, explain, you know, here's what we're, we're doing with privacy, here's how we're trusting your students and here's what we've got as like a safety net in place. I think the key is the communication with the parents. Um, we have um, Tuesdays and Thursdays we invite our parents in. Um, the first half hour of the school day and we do a lot of it used to just be come read with me um, but now it's kind of this is what we're doing this is what we're about hey let's get you you on Twitter so you can follow the class and see what your your child's doing um, they can come in and see all our anchor charts about um, our norms for writing comments and our and our norms for what we can do and can't do on the iPads or on um, when we're Skyping. So um, we make things very visible for the parents and uh, very open and um, we really haven't had many, we haven't had any um, pushback because we're so open about it and uh, we invite them in because we want them to be a part of it and we want them to um, talk to their kids about it when they get home after school. I saw my, my daughter is in kindergarten and her class has a Twitter feed and I get to see her every day because her teacher posts pictures about what they're doing and uh, it's a great feeling feeling that you're a part of that day with them. So that's what we do. Yeah, and I think I think in the question, um, Beth, you really kind of had the answer, and that was, you know, getting out ahead of it and having a system of this is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to work, and this is, you know, our plan and why, and if things break down, um, and then with what Kristen was saying is is that communicating with parents, but getting out ahead of the game, um, and saying this is what we're going to do before you do it, and this is how, you know, this is our plan and this is our rationale before you get into it, so the parents have a chance to digest it. Um, deal with their own thoughts about it before the kids come home and, and, and are talking about it. And sorry, Sue, I didn't want to cut you off, Susie, unless you're about to say something. Or... 
No, I just I think that everyone has brought up great points. It's I think it's really important to be able to put as much stuff out there as we can in a public way, but to keep it safe so that you're protecting student privacy and still allowing them to broaden their audience and and to experience more of what's going on outside their classroom walls. But um, being able to do that in a safe way is just essential, and parents need to know that that's how we plan to do it so that they feel more comfortable. And it's also important to support those parents who choose not to have their kids participate because I don't think that that's, that that's a bad thing. So they're very little and if they choose to not have them participate then I need to figure out ways to have that student included in ways that feels just as meaningful as what we're doing online. So um, I think that that's always important to remember too. And actually to build off that point, there was a question from the audience, like how do you differentiate these types of projects for students, you know, when there might be some processing deficits, when not all children are on the same like emotional and, you know, emotional playing field or on the same intellectual level or, you know, it could be a reading level or even, you know, just an understanding of, you know, some of the, the social aspects of it, you know, you know, these are really little, you know, we're dealing with the youngest of students and they're not all in the same place and so how do you you know, differentiate across that type of a spectrum. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I think I think you're. It's just like regular teaching. You're going to differ differentiate with those kids for reading, for math, um, and it's the same at, for um, using technology. And I think that um, a lot of the students that do have difficulties. Um, are they um, shine on the technology? Um, it's it's something that they are really great at, and they take to very quickly. Um, and with with my class, we try to collaborate as much as possible. So um, usually they are paired up with a buddy, and um, so there might be someone there that's helping that student too. Um, but I. I, we really haven't had many issues just because we. I find that most of those students are fantastic on the technology. You can have them read things, you know, the technology itself um, has so many um, accessibility options on it that can help those um, learners. So. Yeah, and I find that technology makes it easier in teaching an integrated class for the last two years, having such a wide range of learners, that technology has made that easier to be able to reach them and also to be able to motivate them to be engaged in um, what we're doing and what we're learning. And there's a tool for everyone, whether it's a student who is a non-reader or a student who, who doesn't speak at school, there's a way f to engage them all using technology so it's I think it's just a natural um, way to innovate for every level yeah I think that it's it's you know the same way that we that we differentiate for anything else and Susie you had mentioned engagement um, and certainly if we're doing really exciting things with technology kids are going to be engaged um, and you know in my experience our struggling learners are going to are going to struggle they're going to they're going to they're going to push a little harder they're going to persevere a little more if they're engaged and excited about what they're doing um, and if we can leverage the technology to get those kids to uh, you know to persevere i think i think that can be really powerful um, ben i'm actually going to put you on the spot because you right. sent me the boston globe article earlier this week but yeah. how about with you know we're talking a lot about having these kids on devices but um, you know, there's also been a lot of pushback lately about screen time and saying that students are sharing too much. And so when you're starting to bring this both to students and to families, I mean, how do you address the importance of creating these opportunities uh, so they understand that there's that, you know, whether it's a balance or, or to, to frame it, you know, counter to the arguments about screen time and sharing too much? Yeah, so with, with screen time, one of the things that I like to ask um, you know, other teachers and, and parents is what kind of screen time are we talking about here? And is all screen time the same? Um, you know, that at one end we've got kids watching, you know, the Saturday morning cartoons that, that we grew up with, um, which was just, you know, consuming mindless content so that we wouldn't cause trouble. That's at one end. On the other end, um, I can put a kid on an iPad and have them take the video game in their head and program that at an elementary level using something like Hopscotch or Scratch. And that's a really different different use of screen time. 
um, that it's really easy to lump those together and say, yeah, the kids on the iPad. Um, but watching watching cartoons versus creating something versus taking that idea that's in your head and turning it into something and troubleshooting it um, when it doesn't work, those are really, really different cognitive experiences. And when we talk to parents about screen time and talk to educators about screen time, one of the things that I really try to push is, well, what kind of screen time is it? You know, is it is it just consuming or is it creating? Uh, and and I think you know just and I've jumped you know I said I was putting you on the spot, but thinking as well, you know, when we're talking about connecting two classrooms, you know, there's definitely that inherent value, and it's not to say that face to face connections aren't important, but it's providing that other opportunity and that different opportunity to be able to extend the learning environment. Um, you know, Susie and Kristen, I don't know if you've had any other experiences with this as well. Um, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I feel that um, there is, there's definitely, even on the iPad, there's two, two different, there's gameplay and consumption apps like um, playing Angry Birds for hours at a time, opposed to um, on the other spectrum is using Explain Everything, right, to create something, to show your learning, to make your think thinking visible. Um, so um, there's definitely two ends of the spectrum here, and um, hopefully we're not we're more on the content creation um, side of things in school than on the consumption side, um, and then. With screen time and no screen time, I think there is, you can't be on um, on a device all day long. There has to be a happy medium. Students still need to put a pencil to paper uh, once in a while and, you know, use manipulatives and, and touch things and um, paint and create that way. So um, I think you have to have, like, a happy medium. And I think it's a, it's, it's a matter of choice, too. My students always have the choice. If you don't want to do this, on a device, then you can do it, um, you know, in your notebook, or you can show me with a poster. So they have that choice to be on the device or not. Yeah, and when we have um, BYOD, we try to keep it limited to only a couple of days a week, so that those opposite days we have that chance to to stick to more um, hands-on ways of learning and showing what we know. We're working with a school in Guatemala this year, and their technology access, <laughs> it's, ours isn't that great right now, so there's probably... Um, isn't far away from ours, but we'll be doing a lot that doesn't involve technology in order to be able to connect with them. But then in other ways, we're trying to think of ways that we can connect with them using technology, even though they don't really have any. Like, can we make videos and burn them to DVDs? Do they have DVD players? So they're starting to think outside the box, like, how can we make this work? How can we use technology to connect with them when they don't have technology? And then in other ways, how can we connect with them in just good old fashioned senses too. Yeah. And even in, in the one-to-one -one environment, um, you know, we are not iPads all day every day, nor do we want to become that. Um, you know, everybody tonight has talked about the iPads being a tool and sometimes it's, it's the right tool and sometimes it's not. And if it's not the right tool, then we put them away. Um, you know, as the, as the tech person, I've got my iPad out, you know, a lot of the time. The teachers like to give me a hard time when I pull out a sticky note and jot down a note, but sometimes that sticky note is the right tool for, you know, for the job. And when those iPads are the right tool, then let's let's use them and leverage that uh, that technology. And if it's not the right tool, then we don't need to be tied to them. Great. Well, on that note, I'm going to use uh, use that as sort of our last question to to wrap this up. But if you could give, you know, what what practical advice would you have, you know, or what's your favorite resource to share, you know, with other educators who are interested in, you know, opening up their classroom and whether it's learning with blogging or through like, uh, you know, inner classroom collaboration, you know, what are some first steps, like, before you even, you know, set everything up and ways that you might want to get started? Or what would you suggest as a starting point? I would suggest, suggest not looking for apps that will teach your content for you. Um, there's an awful lot out <laughs> there, but look for those apps that, that are really versatile. Um, Explain Everything came up. Um, Book Creator is a favorite of mine. Um, we use DrawingPad as well. And with those three apps there, you can do 
everything in every content area that you want to do with it. Um, rather than spending a lot of time looking for those little things to teach short vowels or long vowels or one concept in mathematics, look for those, those programs that, can, that, that really help kids explain what's going on in their head. Because um, you can take those across content areas, you can use them all the time, and then kids become experts at them because they're using them all the time, they're using them from year to year. So look for those, those, those apps that have really broad, broad, broad applications. Kristen? Uh, I'm working across my, the okay. bottom of my screen now. Um, I, I, a few things that um, I always tell teachers that are starting that want to connect, there's a few, um, there's a few sites that are fantastic. Um, I love uh, Projects by Jen, is a site uh, by Jen Wagner, and um, Susie's given the thumbs up. Um, it's, it's a fantastic site that she kind of puts the whole project together and um, you sign up and she sends you all the information and you're in this global project that you have the option to Skype with, with the other members. Um, it's, it's, it's baby steps. You can do as much as you want or you can hold back and just do the project in your classroom. You could just uh, take pictures and tweet it out if you want. So um, Projects by Jen is a fantastic uh, resource that I totally think that um, if you are starting, that, that's something to start with. Um, also, there's another website called ePals, and it's um, a collaboration website also that um, you can put in your grade level and the language you speak and the topic that you want, and you can search that, and hundreds of projects will come up, and you, um, from Skyping to um, these huge online collaborative projects. So um, I, would, I would start with those two websites just because they they kind of set it up all for you and uh, and you can start as little as you want. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, they kind of scaffold you. I think that probably some of my first global projects were with Projects by Jen, I love her stuff. Um, I think another easy quick one is put out by Teachers First and it's on Twitter. It's their hashtag that's um, across the world once a week and it's so it's hashtag XW1W. So every week they put out a new question and it could be anything from what are the types of transportation in your area to does your family grow food or how many teachers work in your classroom or what's your favorite breakfast beverage. So it's just one simple question. It's something that you can do whole class. It's something that kids could do individually. We use paper Twitter sheets so each kid could do their own. Um, sometimes we tweet together and do it right onto the screen. So it's it's just a way to kind of dip your toe in and it, once a week, you know, answer the question and then look and see the answers that are responded to from other areas. It's kind of fun. Cool. I didn't know that one. I didn't either. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yay. Sydney, you're cool. going to have to tweet that one out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you'll have to tag it with CE14 since that's the one we're using. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. I, have, I have homework to do. Okay. Yep, you have homework. Um, well, I'm going to use Susie's homework as our, our kind of our la having the last day for our night. And I, I have to thank all of you for, for joining us tonight and for everyone in the audience. But especially for, you know, Susie and Kristen and Ben, thank you so much for being here because. Again, I know I can't have a conversation about connected learning without talking about you, so it's just so much nicer to have you here. Uh, but for everyone who has joined this conversation, there will be the full video recording of this webinar available immediately. Thank you, Google Hangout on Air. Uh, on Connected Learning TV, uh, we're also going to put a copy of it over at edtechteacher.org. We'll have other curated content on the way that you can share with your network. And so uh, thanks again to everybody. This wraps up the first webinar of our Connected Educator Month series. Um, but know that's not where the conversations have to end. So hopefully everyone will keep getting involved with the ongoing conversations on Twitter um, using Susie and Kristen's hashtags as well as CE14 and by making new friends within the Connected Learning Google Plus community. So if you'd like to know, um, know more about the upcoming webinars from us at EdTech Teacher and joined in here with Connected Learning TV, uh, please visit Connected Learning TV and sign up for their email newsletter. Or I'll say you can also come over to EdTech Teacher and sign up for ours. We'll both tell you about everything that is going on right now for the next month. Um, but we hope you'll join us again next Tuesday, October 14th, same time, which is uh, 5 p.m. Pacific or 8 p.m. Eastern, and this time we're going to talk about 
how a parent can support their children's learning, and that will be a new set of guests. So thank you again to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ben and Kristen and Susie. And with that, have a wonderful evening, and we'll look forward to continuing the conversations online. So if you guys want to... Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. That was awesome. Thanks.